Welcome to the Bioptimizer's Awesome Health Podcast. And now, here's your host, Wade T. Lightheart. What is Awesome Health? It's actually an acronym that stands for Air, Water, Exercise, Sunshine, Optimizers, Mental Beliefs and Attitudes, and Education. These are the pillars of peak health, and my team and I have created a free 12-week course that you can use to transform. Each day, you'll get a written and video lesson delivered to your inbox. Everything is covered from the foundations of digestion to advanced alternative therapies few people know about. And again, it's 100% free. Just go to bioptimizers.com. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S. Dot com. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening wherever you are. I'm Wade T. Lightheart from the Awesome Health Podcast, and today we have a very special guest all the way from Finland, Oli Posti, who's going to teach us today how to survive in a supermarket and how you can discover why, why food in supermarkets may not be good for you, what to look out for, what to upgrade, and how to enjoy eating without guilt. Uh, Oli is an author. He's what I would call a health influencer and a health product designer. Got a quite an extensive history in the field. Uh, we met up uh, way back uh, last fall in the, there was a kind of like a biohacking summit in Norway or Finland and it was pretty fun and a lot of great people and there's a huge community of biohackers and superfood advocates and health advocates in the Scandinavian countries. And so we were looking to bring in some of our friends from overseas to share some of the insights that they have in regards to achieving the next level of health. Now, Ole has been a superfood blogger and product advisor since 09, as I talked about. His new tricks work, and we'll talk about that in a minute, has been widely read for 10 years. And get this, he ate his way out of multiple sclerosis. Think about that. I mean, this is a very debilitating condition, and he's been on the front lines uh, for over a decade promoting healthier eating, nutrient-dense foods, and supermarket survivalisms, and right now. Now, there's also something we're going to find out about. He was involved in founding in developing the, let me see if I'm saying this right, free tax, free toxajot community. I don't know if I spelled, got that right. You know, my finish yeah, is terrible. Free tox, free tox, yeah. Free tox, okay, great. And was chosen as the Finnish Health Influencer of the Year 2016. So, and his supermarket survival for the love of food and well being has been a best selling book in. Finland. So uh, we'll put his links in here on how you can find out about it and learn about what's happening overseas. Oli, welcome to the show. Wow, that's a nice intro. I, I wonder where you actually got all that information from because none of that is really in the English language yet. I, I don't think so. So <laughs> we're nice to uh, that. We go very deep at the Awesome Health podcast show. So I have my my secret agent, Vida, who will go in and translate information and extract all the information that we possibly can on everybody that we bring onto the show. We like to do a little due diligence. So uh, we selected you. And so some of that translation came through. And that's why I was kind of like, ah, I don't know if we got this right. Let me see. <laughs> but hey, welcome to the show. Yeah, I mean, that was really amazing because I was like, okay, we're going to talk about something, but you actually know a lot about me, so this is going to be a great conversation. So, I want to I want to go this backstory right off the bat because this is really powerful. How did you eat your way out of multiple sclerosis? So, first, like, what happened before? Maybe a little background on your lifestyle before, and then what led to the diagnosis and then what that was like, and then kind of moving into how you just kind of took things into your own hands. I mean, this is a pretty remarkable story. And I think it's very motivating and inspiring for people who are suffering from conditions, uh, whatever they might be. Now we're not here to treat or cure or anything like that, but I think the power of food, Hippocrates once said, let, uh, 
medicine, food be your medicine and medicine be your food. So tell me about your background story. Where did it all start? Yeah, I mean, it was crazy, crazy. Uh, when I was 10 years old, I got asthma diagnosis and I was always using medication for that. And when I was like uh, 19 years old, then I got the multiple sclerosis diagnosis. And, and then uh, when I was around 20, I did find out a thing or two about health, natural health. And then I got rid of the asthma pretty fast. But then the multiple sclerosis, uh, that wasn't so easy. So that actually took me many years of serious study into just holistic health. Everything that I can do to just uh, make, <laughs> make my health better. So initially I was like, okay, uh, like there are these bad foods, these inflammatory foods that I shouldn't maybe eat so much of. And then there are those good foods. And then I realized at some point that, okay, but in a way, for example, right amount of sunlight or a better quality air, for example, they are also like good nutrients. And then there are bad things like, let's say, bad emotions or bad thoughts or bad company or whatever. So I was just basically, uh, it was a long process of, upgrading my life and every part of it and realizing that there are so many different things that actually affect our, our health and healing. And uh, also one thing I noticed was that when I'm, when I'm engaged in doing some things that I really love, then I'm not feeling pretty much any of those symptoms. So that was also one thing that, that was very uh, important for me. Uh, but yeah, it was quite crazy. Uh, so Around, when, did you, uh, when, when did you get your diagnosis? That was uh, 2002. Okay, so you were how old at both this time? Uh, yeah, that was 19. 19, so you had asthma around 10, you said? Yeah, yeah. And then you kind of corrected that, but then you got 19, you got, the M, you got the MS, and this is like next level of stuff. And then how long did you, did you, what was this journey like? How long did you start, you know, step by step, piece by piece? And I think that's an important part. A lot of people yeah. want to start and say, okay, I want something that's going to fix me tomorrow. I want like, like, what do I need to do? Do I need to eat this goji berry? Is that going to fix this? And it's no, that's not it. It's a, it's yeah. a lifestyle. Yeah, it's approach. a journey. It's a journey. It's, yeah. it's a journey. So take us on that journey. So about how long was that whole thing and what were some of the pieces that came through for you? Yeah, three or four years, something like that. First, <laughs> the journey started by me realizing that I don't really have any hope. So <laughs> I would just just go, just spend my money and whatever. <laughs> I have a few years maybe left, so let's just do fun things. And then at some point, it, it was so bad that I couldn't really do that many fun things anymore. So, so then I was just sitting on the internet or in the library or wherever <laughs> just trying to find something, some hope. And then I found something, for example, through Joseph Merkola that, okay, maybe vitamin D has something to do with it. Maybe turmeric might have, or whatever. So I was, uh, whenever I found something that might help, then, then I, I followed that trail. Uh, most of those trails that offered any kind of hope were considered very woo-woo by the mainstream. So I wouldn't have paid attention, any attention to those uh, without my uh condition so so that was was a nice nice thing in the end and then I think, um I, just before you go on there i want to just interject because i think that's really important based on the medical model there really wasn't much hope for you it was more of like a managed yeah. decline until you know you know yeah yeah and and there's power in that from understanding that you 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 just didn't accept that but at some point you, you, you changed and said, Hey, you know what, I'm, what do I got to lose? I'm going to try some of these other things. How did you, what was the emotional or psychological process that led you to that? What, what was that? What was that moment where you just made the switch? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for me, it was basically just, uh, part of it was just letting go. And part of it was, uh, like hor horror <laughs> basically, or, just historical feelings <laughs> driving me. I think most of the drive came from horrible feelings and uh, hopeless feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but of course, it was a lot of fun. It, uh, not just fun. I mean, it, it was amazing feelings just finding out even some, some little piece of some kind of hope. I, I, so, I want to talk about that a little bit because I think, you know, for, for those who haven't, 
heard or don't know my own story is I, I remember when my sister was diagnosed with cancer and when it became terminal and, you know, the, the feelings and the emotions and stuff. Can, can you describe for people, because I think there might be some people that are listening that might be going through something challenge. What were some of the thoughts that were coming up for you on the negative side? Because I know we, I, we're going to get to the positive side and the good news and stuff, but I really want to capture what that feeling was like. And, and, and what was it like to be a young man and saying, I'm, 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 I'm going, I'm essentially dying and it's not going to be a quick death or a, easy death, it's going to be actually a very painful and comfortable decline. What, 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 was, what yeah. was going on for you? I mean, initially, it's, it's like uh, there are so many things that you take for granted when you're like 20 years old. Uh, you don't realize how easy you've had it all the time. You've had problems, but those, those kinds of uh, first world problems mostly in your life, really. And then at some point, uh, all the things you love to do, you can't really do them anymore, like playing guitar or playing tennis or whatever it is. And uh, how does I it? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, part of it is, is the worst possible feelings that you could imagine, but also a part of it is like, uh, okay, like I don't have anything to lose anymore. So uh, in some ways, your momentary happiness can actually even go up because uh, there are no expectations anymore of, of yourself or from anybody else or from the society or all of those things that, that would weigh me down in a way for all my life without even realizing it. All those kind of uh, piece by piece dropped away. So in a way, it was also complete freedom, but also you, it was complete uh, just being scared, basically. That's really, really powerful. Um, I'm an advocate of a um, kind of a spiritual teacher by the name of Dr. David Hawkins, and one of his books was called uh, Surrender. And the reality is, is that everybody, people think of surrender as a passive thing. But he said the power of surrender is when you actually surrender to the absolute truth that your life is going to end or that you're going to die yeah. or, or whatever that horrible thing that you're feeling. If you can get to the point where you just sit on it and surrender and surrender and surrender until it loses a thing, this is the part where you become super powerful. And of course, um, this was also a meditation that the samurai used to do. They would do seven meditations on their own death before they would go into battle because they felt that they could only fight their best once they had accepted the potential outcome of their demise. And, and I've noticed for people who have um, kind of accepted that as, as, as there's a key moment and, and the people that I've studied who have overcome life-threatening illnesses is somehow they surrender that say, like, I got nothing to lose. I've made peace with it, but I'm going to go do this and get as much out of it as possible. And, and it's, it's very magnetic and powerful to be around. Those people are very different. They're just wired up different in the world. They're not under the illusions that so many of us live under day to day. So, so you, you made that choice and then you started moving in the quote unquote woo woo direction. Yeah. And uh, in some ways, sometimes that was even more scary because my identity was completely wrapped in a certain kind of worldview. So it was very scary to let go of that but at some point uh, <laughs> uh, the fear of actual dying <laughs> became bigger than mm -hmm. the shall we say ego death of having to change my mind and change my world right and then at some point like the, the, i would describe the process like this i i have this worldview that i'm kind of hanging on to and then i had to let go of that and i find something else that okay if i eat this way, then I will be better. But then at some point I realized this is not enough. So I have to uh, get back to the drawing board again. And then at some point I realized that actually this is not, this, this is not so uh, scary. It's actually kind of fun. Like, uh, like being hooked on uh, skydiving or something like that. But it's, right. it's not really, it's safer than, than you would think to change your mind, basically. <laughs> so... Yeah, it's been a fun journey, actually, after that. That's a, that, that, should be a I, that could be a slogan. 
change your mind. It's safer than you think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like that. It is. is. We're so yeah. locked into these identities or habitual patterns or social constructs or yeah. tribalism or these identity forms that we take on sometimes unconsciously and sometimes consciously that changing our mind seems to be more of a threat from the old, I'm going to be excommunicated from whatever quote unquote tribe I feel, which was certain death and historical patterns, but doesn't necessarily apply in today's world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, today it's the opposite. Uh, your um, ability to operate in the, in the modern world is, is largely based on you being able to change your mind fast and also even change your friends fast if, if needed or, or just uh, adapt to new conditions very, very rapidly. So in retrospect, it has all been, <laughs> been a blessing for me because I was definitely one of those people that nowadays I still see on the internet who are like, everything is the way I believe and there's nothing else. Right. And, uh, I, nowadays I just block them immediately because I know that there's nothing that they can learn from me because they don't learn and mm -hmm. and there's nothing that I can learn from them because I already know how they think so yeah yeah I was listening to a podcast with uh, Ray Dalio Dalio um, the founder of Bridgewater and one of the wealthiest persons in the world he wrote a book called Principles and he yeah, said and he, and, and he studies um, neuropsychology and neurophysiology which I do as well and he pointed out a really illustrating point is that the way the brain works up is we make a decision and then we seek evidence to support that bias. And it's very hard to overcome that, but in a life threatening very situation yep. forces yeah. you to adapt. And then the breakthrough is, is yeah, I can change my mind. I can change my friends. I can change my diet. I can change it. So what were the things that you started to do and what, you know, that, that started to work or that you felt that was, you know, getting you results? Yeah, initially, like 2004, 2005, just really basic things like uh, less white sugar, less white flour, less processed or ultra-processed milk products, less of those ultra-processed seed oils, industrial seed oils, and less of uh, certain additives like monosodium glutamate, things like that. And also less of some, some obviously bad things like things that you cannot pronounce <laughs> in, the, in the food labels. And then more of things like, um, like spices or just actual, actual vegetable colors, things like that. Uh, more of better hydration. And also vitamin D, uh, omega-3 fatty acids. And then uh, by the end of 2015, I found... Uh, I bumped into Mike Adams, the, the natural news guy. And back then he was talking more about nutrition. So through him, I discovered chlorella and spirulina and also bee pollen, some of those superfoods. And then uh, during that time, I, for the first time, I felt like this is actually going in a better direction. I feel like my um uh, like my um like my brains are growing back or something like that i i feel like i'm, I'm getting my capabilities back so so, so, so you kind of went the, you, you kind of went from s kind of slowing the decline if you would say yeah. and then all of a sudden it was starting to now you're starting to see hey i'm i'm t i'm gaining back ground and starting to really begin the recovery process yeah yeah, yeah. and that was the best moment <laughs> yeah the wow. best moment ever what was that like? What was that like? You know, coming from such a like you know a dark and depressing place <laughs> to kind of doing that, and then learning piece by piece, and then hitting that kind of apex of the bottom of the curve, and then you're starting to see, hey, this is starting to work. What would, like, how motivating was that? Yeah, I mean, the most amazing feeling ever. And like you said, it was the most motivating feeling ever. Uh, that was de December 2015. So the next year, 2016. I wouldn't do anything else but just study more about nutrition and, and all this stuff. Like, I mean, even before that, I was studying quite heavily, but then I was like, that, that's all, all I was doing, like, all, all day. <laughs> and and even, even when I went to sleep, I would still be uh, listening to, on my iPod, like, for example, lecture from, let's say, uh, David Wolf or, or inspiring people like that. 
And then uh, when I woke up in the morning, I still had the lecture on, on my headphones. Amazing. That's, that's <laughs> uh, amazing. Sub, so. sub, sub, subliminal programming. programming. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's an interesting thing uh, by Earl Nightingale. He's, and he said uh, it was one of the first motivational uh, audios ever produced called The Strangest Secret. And he said, the strangest secret is, yeah. is people, people become what they think of most of the time. And if you're studying yeah. health, if you're studying health exactly. all this time, yeah. eventually you become healthy. You know, it's like, uh, what I find yeah. always interesting with the Western medicine model is that we, we study disease, we study death, we study, you know, all this sort of stuff, but very few of the experts actually study health. And the people who study health are poo-pooed by the people who study disease. It's very ironic, not to condemn yeah. anyone, but I think it's fascinating. So now you're, you're getting momentum, you're listening to the audios, you're, you're taking in superfoods, you're, you're, you're kind of on fire, so then what? Yeah, then, then comes, like, the, the end of 2016, like a year later, I'm, uh, spending the, the holy, holiday season at my parents' place. And I'm feeling like, okay, now I, I feel it in my body that now uh, this fight is kind of over. I, I've overcome this now. And now I can actually start, I, I can give myself the permission to have other passions. So then quite soon after that, I discovered, or in a way rediscovered all this personal development stuff. And uh, even... Yeah, like for example, uh, Steve Pavlina blog. I, I really, uh, I like that a lot and things like that. I, and also I was uh, studying everything from Eben Pagan and also like, mm -hmm. for example, Frank Kern and guys like this to be able to influence the world better and these kinds of things. So yeah, uh, then, then at some point I realized that, wow, like I, I feel like there, there is a solution to every problem, not just health problems, but there, 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 is, there is a solution to pretty much everything that is plaguing people nowadays, not just in terms of health, but all the areas of, of life that we are, that usually plague us in, in one way or another. And that was a very interesting realization. But what, what happened during uh, 2007 was, was also that, uh, I also rediscovered sport. I started playing tennis again, and I got much better results than ever, ever before the diagnosis. That was pretty fun. Uh, like all the, all the doctors that I know, they, they wouldn't believe, like, how can you win tennis tournaments when, you, when you've been diagnosed with MS and things like that. that was so, very so, you, so now you're winning tennis tournaments. So you've gone from a, a, a death sentence with MS, and now you're running around winning tennis tournaments. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there was this uh, B-class national championship. I uh, like the A-class is the is the best, but then there's the B-class and, and some other classes below that. So I had never won a B-class tournament in my life. So now I went to the kind of national championships of of the B-class, and I found I won half of my matches six love six love. Like I, I was I was that good at that point. Wow. Much much better than. Than ever before and, and like my, my coach that had been coaching me like ever since I was a kid he was like what, what happened <laughs> he, he, he couldn't almost believe that and yeah it was crazy and uh, yeah and, and then <laughs> yeah I mean I remember at the end of the summer I played this one match against a guy who was like one of the best in Finland basically and I uh, I lost the match but it was it was like very very even I, I had never been like even close to the top of Finland or anything like that. So, so it was uh, like all my motor skills that I had pretty much lost in the MS, they were like much better than ever. They were much better than average. And one thing that also happened was that I, I never got sick again. <laughs> so, so like my immunity was also like super strong. And uh, also one thing that happened was that I, I, um, when I was younger, I would, uh, my skin would burn pretty easily in, in the sun. So now I wouldn't burn. I, I couldn't burn myself, if, if, no matter what I did. Of course, because you eat so much, so many more carotenoids and things like that. Yeah. So, so there, there were so many cool, cool things. And then also, uh, when, once I, once I, uh, like when I was only uh, focusing on my health studies, I 
I didn't pay any attention to, for example, my physical appearance. <laughs> so, so now I also started getting into like buying clothes and things like that. So, so for the first time in my life, like uh, the uh, the girls were were really into me, <laughs> and they they called me the how how would I say the the fire kid because I was always so energetic and so you know so passionate about everything, things like that. It, yeah, it was a lot like amazing fun, amazing fun. And and then uh, a little bit later, uh, 2008, I because during the winter, I was like for the first time people started asking me questions about health because I wanted to talk about these things, but people just wouldn't believe me. So now people started believing me. So I was on the computer all the time, like answering people's questions and things like that, uh, unless I was having fun with people or something, but I didn't do any sports. So then without a training, without doing any sports, really, I, I, I wanted to see how, how many meters I can run in 12 minutes. That's, that's the Cooper test that we take, for example, in schools yeah. in Finland. Yeah. And I was always pretty good at that. My result was uh, 3,250 meters. That was my best result ever. And uh, now, without any training, I, I did 200 meters better. And that, that was the craziest thing wow. because, uh, but at that point I was, I was on raw food. So my body was like super open in a way that I didn't need that kind of conditioning to be able to just, just run and just keep running. <laughs> it was, that was a crazy feeling because uh, I remember in, in that same, during that same winter be, uh, before that, I would put my, my jeans on and I would start walking to the school and then I would just start running. And then I realized that I'm actually uh, passing all those bikers. So, so I was like, well, what is this? I, I didn't pay more, any more attention to that. But then I tried the Cooper test and I was like, okay, there's, <laughs> there's something here. Like, why, why don't the sports people, why don't the long distance runners know about these things? <laughs> and I was doing a lot of enzymes also and, and like really living foods like sprouts and, and things like that and like heavy MSM and whatever just to get my body like super open and and take all the all the uh all the i can take off from my digestion to make uh my di digestion as good and as easy as possible and save all that energy for for all those other healing processes in my body it's it's a powerful message and you know um i was attending uh a Tony Robbins event last fall, and I highly recommend everybody go check it out. Uh, his date with destiny is extraordinary. And he was dealing with people who were uh, in, you know, everything from people who are suicidal to relationships that wouldn't work. And he said, look, the problem in your life is uh, not a lack of resources. It's a lack of resourcefulness in today's world. And, you know, you've just kind of outlined how in a very compromised state, you just started looking for the answers and they're there today. This is the beauty of living in the modern world with digital technology and the internet and all these things is, yeah. is those answers are there. You have to go out and find them. And uh, you did. And then, then, then once you found them, then you said you took it to another level. There's another self-expression for yourself as a, as a physical being, but there's another piece that I want to get into next. And, and, and that is, uh, I think what happens with most people, because I mean, you've got the classic hero's journey. If you were to look at uh, yeah. Joseph, Joseph yeah. Camp Campbell's illustration of heroes, like you've lived that on a, at, at a very young age, which is quite unusual. Yeah. But usually, what happens at the next stage is people come <laughs> and say, "Hey, wait, now now that we've 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 slain the dragon and we've got the we've won the prize, now we got to come back and tell everybody about the stories of what we've learned." So. Talk about to uh, talk to us about uh, your book, your work, Nutrix, all, all this sort of stuff that you're currently doing today as uh, a health and wellness and vitality expert that you are, and 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 helping others who are are looking to have uh, a healthier day. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've said it many times that if I had been, let's say, born five years earlier, I wouldn't have had a chance because the internet just came around. So, but um, the people that helped me out, 
guys like, for example, Joseph Merkel or Mike Adams, or or later this guy called Wade Lightheart, who was this raw bodybuilder. Uh, oh, there, there were a lot of a lot of really cool names, and I, I felt such such a depth of gratitude to those people and their their bravery that I felt like I totally owe this second chance to live to those people and their bravery. So I will try to do the same. And anytime I I would follow this these people and their message. I was learning a lot, but I was getting very inspired to do the same because I was like, well, like these are the kinds of people that I have been looking for my whole life, but I, I never really found those kinds of people. And then I started trying to find those people. And then I started using internet to find those people. Just I just put my message out there. I stopped trying to argue with people. And anytime I had something that I wanted to say passionately, I would write a blog post. And then later, in also in other other social medias but uh, one thing that i learned from studying nutrition was to be able to discern the official not so good information from the really passionate underground high quality information so after that uh, anytime i've had to <laughs> when i've been in a situation where i have limited time to find really good information on any subject, I have kind of used that same intuition or same experience to do that. So after I I wrote my Nutrix uh, guide guidebook, I, the next eight months I studied passionately just about uh, marketing and and influence and things like this. Uh, and then, yeah, after about those eight months, I was ready to. Uh, to put up my, my blog, and that also became a pretty instant success. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still on the, on the same road, but <laughs> there have been bumps on the road also, <laughs> definitely. So at some point, actually, the, the Finnish, Finnish media actually at, attacked me very, uh, very, very hard, because uh, I was always, just like the people who kind of saved my life, I was always also very outspoken, and I didn't, censor myself I here in Finland if you if you are in the public eye you have to be very politically correct otherwise you will be attacked very harshly so that's what eventually happened to me around uh, 2011 and then <laughs> after that next five or four years I was actually living on social support mostly and a part of that time I was also homeless a couple of times and things like that so so it wasn't just just roses and and butterflies but still even through those four or five years throughout those years I was like behind the scenes I was still helping the, the companies in this field and the influencers in this field to do their job better in a way and then once I was <laughs> I was able to to get my get myself back on track, then of course they have been help, helping me me back also. Now I I have been on uh, standing on my own own feet uh, a few years uh, or maybe three, three or four years or something like that. Uh, but but still, yeah, it it hasn't been easy, but but it's been. I think you make nice. a great, and, I think you make a great point to to interject. Um, and that is when someone comes up uh, against kind of the social conditioning of whatever, and this is a very big issue that I, I, I'm very concerned about in the world today, which is uh, political correctness, which we are losing the sense of, of, of following the individual's identity or their journey that they have discovered and listening to them as a point of, of influence or interest or uh, possible teaching and now there's there's collective pressure from media channels to make everybody fit into some sort of group or identity or whatever as a yeah. group. and it's I, I don't know if people historically understand the consequences of that and there's a lot of great voices uh, in in all areas in all fields who have had breakthrough discoveries uh, I've talked with world-renowned scientists, scientists who are put down by their peers because they've proven their peers wrong. 
uh, and the peers are the ones to judge them whether they get peer reviewed journals or whatever. So they can't do real science. I've seen yeah. health advocates who are, you go to Quack Watch and you'll see all these people who are, and who is that run by? It's run by uh, other special interest groups who are not interested, who have other financial interests in you not going down one route or another. And then I also see people in the holistic health industry who kind of attack the medical community. And, I, and, yeah. and, and so it's, it's on both sides of the aisle, I think. And the reality is, is it's come to, with the internet, bringing so many choices. We have one, I can live my life in a little echo chamber with my little tribe, and we can reaffirm my biases and condemn everybody else. Or two, I can expose myself to a variety of informations and kind of extract the commonalities out of each one of those and create a more unified theory for myself and then experiment from there. And, and, and I want to commend you for staying true to your mission, which is very, I, I, almost every health advocate I know has been viciously attacked at some point, either online, in person, through media, on TV, whatever it happens to be. And sometimes even jailed, sometimes threatened, sometimes gone to court. So sued a variety of different things of avenues that are to do to take out the truth. How did you um, fight through that no matter what? What was, what was, what was, what was, what? Yeah. What, 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 what you <clears throat> and now for a Bioptimizer's fixed digestion tip. Rapid Cheat Meal Relief. Research shows that cheat meals can actually be an effective way to boost your metabolism. One key weight loss hormone, leptin, can be increased by up to 30% following a cheat meal. The challenge with the cheat meals is that all those extra calories and lower food quality can be hard to digest, which means you could be totally sidelined with a food coma after big cheat meals. The solution is to take strong digestive enzymes like masszymes, which will help rapidly digest and break down the extra food. Three to five capsules before or right after your cheat meal can make a huge difference in how you feel following the cheat meal. If it's a cheat day with multiple large meals, you might want to go up to 10 capsules or higher to help you power through all that food. To save 10% on masszymes, go to masszymes.com. That's M A S S. Z-Y-M-E-S dot com and enter the code CHEAT10 at checkout. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, there, <clears throat> there has been value in being a zealot and uh, feeling very strongly about something for, for a while. And then <laughs> there has also been value in learning my lesson and uh, accepting more multiple perspectives and not being so so passionate about one one view or, or something like that sometimes i miss these guys like like david wolf back when back in like uh, 2005 6 7 8 when he was still kind of under the radar so he was able to just speak his mind and he didn't have to censor himself or anything like when you find some some for example video or audio of David Wolf from like uh, 2001. Like he's, he's on fire, 2003, he's on fire. And then like last 10 years, he's been just attacked so viciously that nowadays he doesn't even even uh, appear that much in, in things. And nowadays I'm, I'm listening to, to more, uh, let's say uh, scientific and more, more kind of polished people. Like for example, I think Ben Greenfield is, is a good example. Like he's, He's such such a great guy, uh, but still, like I, I, I don't get that same. I don't get that same emotion. I don't, I don't get that same hardcore inspiration from from pretty much anybody today, and even from myself. Even myself, I censor my, myself nowadays, and I, I try to be more correct, but I also try to be more uh, accepting of everybody's opinions and things like that. But <clears throat> but lately, I've been feeling like maybe. Can, can I get can I get that hardcore passion? Can I get some of that back into my uh, into my videos or into my talks or or into my into my text that I publish? And uh, now that we have this corona epidemic, I'm I have a have a uh, half ready <coughs> immune guide that I have written 
without any censorship of myself, just speaking like I would speak to my friend behind the scenes. Uh, with, and and it's, it's like, wow, like I, I can still write like this, and, but I'm not sure if it, I can publish this, this, but I want to find a way to publish things like this because uh, we are all so, in this field, we are so used to being very uh, mindful about our words. And there, there, there's of course benefit to that, but, but still, I wouldn't be here uh, if there hadn't been guys like, for example, David Wolf, who's not uh, even factually correct always, but, but he's speaking to you like, like, like a good friend. And that's, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's something that I have been thinking about lately. I, I, I feel like I owe it, I still owe it to myself or, or to some, some, some universe or something to, to bring that out, uh, out of myself a, a bit more, I, I think. But uh, w what was your question again? I, know, I was just kind of tapping into, I was just talking about and co-commiserating, I guess, about like what you say, that now you get to a certain level of success or notoriety and, and all of a sudden the you know, the people come out with the knives to attack you, or then you, then you do, you start have to, to correct. I know my own, in my own journey, very often I have to, you know, um, correct what I'm saying or censor what I'm saying or put it through a, what I would call a, a filter um, so that it fits the current political and legal environments that we live in and which is in in a way those things were designed to protect us to have freedom and liberty but now the very things that are suppo that's supposed to to give the the guidance and growth of the individual for freedom and liberty and self-expression and self-discovery and self-actualization are actually the institutions who are now stifling it which is which is interesting and this is, happens periodically throughout time you know i mean we can go back to Socrates and you know it's a beautiful play and I think everyone should read it the written by Plato which is called the death of Socrates where Socrates who has who has been charged for corrupting the youth of Athens to his philosophy yeah. is is he he has to either rescind his what his statements are or or drink the hemlock poison poison and and the the play is beautiful because he gets all of his top disciples to come in and he argues, he argues that he has to drink the poison and die, but he asks each one of them to convince him using the various <laughs> philosophical methods, messages to, to, to say, no, uh, you, you need to live. Because he says, I want to live, but I see no option other than to, to stay true to my words. And I thought that's a very powerful expression and something that is, I think, fueled um, conscious movements or individuals who push to the extremes that you know whether it's Martin Luther King or whether it's a Gandhi or whether it's any one of these individuals who have emerged throughout history as a rebel rouser as someone to ignite the people when they've lost the the sense of what an essence of what it is to be a human um, very very powerful it's, yeah, and it's something I think we all struggle with on a certain level of, is 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 how to best express that yeah, I think also one thing that I've been observing lately is that whenever I'm having a really deep conversation with a friend or just trying to give, give value, give valuable insight to, to a friend, like mentor my friend, for example, I have never once cited a scientific study. I, I have never even used a difficult word. So right. why the hell do we do it when we talk in public about health? Well, because we kind of have to. But that's not the way we talk. That's not the way we give value to other people. That's not the, the way we teach. That's not the way we mentor. That's not the way we write. That, but so, so it's kind of like we, we have been handicapped in a way. Like we, we cannot express ourselves very freely in this, in this field. And I, I would really love to be able to bring that back. And then when somebody says that, how can you write like that about health? I'm like, yeah, watch me. I can. I can write up like that about health. And this is not scientific information, but this is I, anytime I'm able to bring at least some of that into my, for example, writing, it gets like, like a million shares or things like that. Because people love that. They, they feel like, wow, finally somebody is talking like a person to a person and not like some difficult to understand authority 
to somebody who's not going to understand it anyway, but <laughs> feels maybe inferior. <laughs> you know, um, I was reviewing uh, Jordan Peterson, who is an outspoken uh, university professor in Toronto, who stepped up against um, literally the government uh, determining uh, what he called compelled speech. And they made it all about gender, but it wasn't about gender. That was not his issue. His issue was the yeah. government compelling speech. And he stood out and, and then came to worldwide fame. And um, he's very insightful and a well-thought person. And of course, now he's going through some health challenges of his own right now. And his wife is dying and our prayers are with uh, Dr. Peterson. But he pointed out a, a great writing. And he suggested that everybody today read it, which is a fellow by the name of Alexander Solzhenitsyn who wrote the Gulag Archipelago in the middle of the, the communist regime. And one of the excerpts from, and I'll take this, uh, I'll paraphrase something that Jordan Peterson actually illustrated that Solzhenitsyn determined is that he realized that a certain part, and he had a very tragic life. I mean, he was on the war, he was wounded, he was in the Gulag, he ended up in the Gulag. He was, he was just, just a horrific, he had disease. This is terrible life, very, very tragic life. And he wrote this incredible book of overcoming that point. And there was a point in his journey in his life where he realized and recognized that he had been part of that problem of control. He had been part of that problem that had condemned the other people. And, 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 and he realized that he was in the gulag partly because of his own choices in his life. And I think so many people now are here quarantined, uh, for this virus that is spreading around the world, supposedly, and, and, and the consequences of that, and people are living home, and people are social distancing, and people are really have got to this component. And what a beautiful time to kind of bring this up. Um, but you've written a book, and you've written a blog, and you are fully expressing yourself about that. So can you talk to us about that message that you are putting in that book that, that, you, that that's so important? Yeah, this is the book. I hope it will be in English at some point. But the uh, the book's the book's name is for everyone, just so they got it. Supermarket survival. Beautiful. So it's an English name, but it's a Finnish book <laughs> because it's <laughs> such a catchy name. It's a catchy name, so yeah, we decided to use that uh, against the advice of of many people. But yeah, it, uh, the main message is that uh, I mean <laughs> there are so many diets, and what is a diet? It's that you have to eat these things that you maybe wouldn't naturally eat and you have to not eat, you have to avoid these things that you maybe would naturally eat. So it's uh, like you, <laughs> you said, you, you talked about compelled speech. Well, a diet is kind of like compelled eating and compelled avoiding. And uh, so this is the opposite. This is that, uh, let's see, what, whatever you like, whatever you are eating at the moment, there are better versions of that. For example, if you're into ice cream, there are organic ice creams and there are even, even better ones that you can make from better ingredients in your home. So, so that's the whole message of this book, that instead of trying to eat something that you don't like or instead of trying to make yourself uh, avoid something that you feel wrong to, you can eat what you want, but even better. <laughs> So, so that's that's the whole that's idea. A, that's I, a beautiful message, and I think something that attracts people. I, I got that people. actually from David Wolf initially. Mm -hmm. David Wolf gave that to me. So, yeah, I'm just passing it on. It's it's a beautiful um, it's a beautiful thought because hey, look, I like ice cream. Okay, well, why not have you know uh, maybe a plant based flavor, or maybe you can do a sugar free ice cream, or maybe you can do a nut yeah. ice cream, or maybe you can make it like. And, and, and you, we see, for us that have been in the health industry, we see these evolutions, things that you could never imagine possibly having before, all of a sudden it can totally happen. You can totally have, and what's, here's another interesting part though that I find, and I'd, I'd like to know if you found this too. And that is, once you found and optimized, quote unquote, the taboo food that you're not supposed to have when you, advocate, you follow a diet and you, you found the, 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 the holy grail of the super health of the, the food that you're not supposed to eat. What I find is once people have mastered that, they tend to go back to a very simple diet. Because all of a sudden, the, the, there's no appeal to, quote unquote, the forbidden fruit. Yeah, yeah. I mean... I, do, I feel very strongly that 
at least in my life, the, the habits that stick are the ones that I actually enjoy and the ones that come somewhat naturally. So let's say that, uh, let's say that I'm trying to uh, stop watching TV. Well, if it doesn't come naturally, then maybe I haven't thought it through enough. Uh, maybe a better strategy would be to replace that with something better, but as appealing. Like, for example, uh, opening a YouTube instead and putting on the Buy Optimizers channel or something like that. That, right. that might work, you know, right, if, right. if I'm into those kinds of videos, for example. So it's just very simple strategic thinking that we just, as a culture, we just don't do. We just We skip that part and we just take the basically the, the stupidest strategy that you can imagine and we just go with that like we, we don't think strategically at all but we don't have to make it make it complicated it's it's very easy whatever you're trying to accomplish uh, just come up with it with a few things can, can it be easier can it be more fun fun in some, some, some ways people try to quit smoking but um, i mean uh, there, there can be many things that you could try replacing that with and some of them might suit you and also uh, like pe people uh, people try to quit eating candy and they almost always fail and once you find uh, for example let's say that you you get hooked on to coconut water and fresh mangoes and things like that you after a week, you're like, why did I ever eat that crap candy? Because like, it's not as good as this. I, I want, mm -hmm. My body craves mangoes much more than the candies, but we never think like that because, of course, the advertisers in TV and, and the big media, they, they don't remind us or nudge us into, into the, the mango aisle. They, they nudge us toward the, the candy aisle. So that's kind of the only problem. And that's, that's why, uh, uh, like you said in the intro, this has been a bestseller book. Not one media uh, has touched this. Uh, not not one of one of the the big medias in in Finland. Like I, I'm in some kind of blacklist because all of their business models are based on food advertising to to some extent extent. And in Finland, all the big medias know that if you get sort of blacklisted by the by the big food industry, then uh, you're gonna have to look for. A smaller office space <laughs> quite soon because you're, you're not gonna yeah so i mean what's, they, in the book, what, that, what's in the book yeah. and how how do you uh, advocate to people what what they should do in the supermarket i think we want to touch on those points what what are the what is the kind of premise and the thoughts and you don't have to reveal everything that's in the yeah. book but you can share what's what's the highlights or what's the points that you're educating people on yeah this there's basically uh, two things that, like I said, that, that you can you can upgrade your choices, but also there are certain things that you can and maybe should add in. Like for example, you should probably add in a broader selection of high quality hydration. That's something that that people in general should probably do, and then also you should probably add in more more greens, especially here in Finland, and and other plant colors. Also, you, you should increase those. You should find ways to, to make it uh, fun and easy and, and tasty to, to increase those if you, if you want to be healthier and make everything else easier down the road. Uh, and then uh, I, whatever, whatever section of the supermarket you go into, there's basically a scale from like super ultra processed, super artificial, super heavily advertised <laughs> to, to the not so advertised, but uh, more fresh, more, more real. And so uh, once, you, once you get a taste of it, it's actually quite easy to discern which is which. Like if, if it says that, uh, if, if there's an adver advertising saying that this product is, is made by, by mums, then it's probably not made by mom's good because it's advertised in the big media. <laughs> and there, there are crazy things like that. Like the, the food advertising is just so, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's wonder that people still fall for that to, to some extent. But I'm trying to immune, immune, give them the immunity, give them the, the vaccine <laughs> against, against the very uh, ugly virus of, of food advertising. And, 
and false information about nutrition. And the big problem is that, especially here in Finland, people, they, they believe what the big media says, but they also, uh, even more, they believe what the government says. And the government uh, says uh, pretty much what the, what the food industry wants them to say. Uh, in the official recommendations, they don't talk about quality at all, except when they talk about the industrial seed oils. They, they say that that's the high quality fat that you should be eating. So it's, in, in many ways, it's, it's the opposite. So, but um, I think it's pretty easy to make people uh, realize and, and get them to open their, their eyes to those kinds of things. Here in Finland, it's, it's a little bit more difficult because people actually, as, as crazy as it sounds, they, they believe in the government uh, very, very heavily. So that's, I think that's the biggest hurdle. But uh, so, so some of my colleagues, they take the strategy that, okay, because everybody believes that the official recommendations have to be correct, because it's kind of like, like the Bible has to be correct. So the government has to be correct because the government is kind of like the God. So, so some of my colleagues take the stance that, okay, we cannot really uh, speak against those official recommendations. So we have to fit our, our model in, into that. So, so we have to find the, the commonalities in the official recommendations and, and maybe just focus on those. And, and uh, if, if the, Official recommendations say that you have to eat these industrial highly processed seed oils. Then, okay, we'll, we'll go with that. We'll go with that. Uh, but I, that's I, <laughs> I, that never helped me. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna gonna lie like that. So, but yeah, that's <laughs> that's why uh, nobody uh, in the in the big media. Uh, wants to say say a word about this but but the social media is, is all all over this so so i i think that's that's a good place to be in uh, because that that means that i i don't really have to censor myself that much because if my position was based on lies then i would have to keep up those lies once once i go go on with my career so it's it's much better this way and it's also much better for my health but still, just getting back to, to what I what I talk about in this in this book. Uh, also, one thing is that um, there are so many good health books with so good so many good recipes, and those recipes require a lot of skill and a lot, lot of time. So it's like okay, it's like if, if you are having a really nice day, then it's it's nice to have those skills and take that time. But how could you actually uh, just make the better quality food apart? a common part of your life so i have most of my recipes are under under one minute it's not like wow. fast it's not like fast 15 minutes recipes it's like fast 15 second recipes i love it yeah so that's that's also very important because that's that's how i do it i i couldn't do it any other way i don't have time to take like a half an hour three to five times a day to make good quality food i, I could never do that so, so I just, I just grab, grab something. So I, I want to teach people to snack better, up, upgrade their snacks and upgrade their fast food, not condemn anything, not, not condemn candy, not condemn uh, fast food or anything like that. Just, just upgrade also, especially the things that we gravitate towards when we're not really thinking about health, because so many people, they get uh, pumped up about health for a week or two and then they get, get back to their old habits because the old habits are more sustainable in a way. They don't require so much effort. So I want to give, I, I want to make sure that at least most of the advice that I give is very effortless and very rewarding in, in many ways. Beautifully said, beautifully yeah. said. And so now uh, we're coming up on the end of the show. So. Um, what are you doing today and where can people uh, find you, get your book and find more information or get, get a hold of your blog? Where, where, where is all this happening? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question too because, uh, yeah, it's uh, interesting because um, I think for most of my career, I have been uh, getting most of my income through social media one way or another, perhaps affiliate marketing or Oh, in, in some ways, 
my income has been tied to my position in the social media. So that means that there's a conflict of interest. Whether I want to admit it or not, there, there is a conflict of interest to some extent. So nowadays I, uh, I get my income from product design. I advise two companies in, in product design and uh, they pay me well enough so that I don't have to try to get any other kind of income. Although sometimes I do, I, I, can, I can give lectures and uh, I, have a, I have an e-course about how to get rid of sugar cravings, for example. And uh, I, I also advise just for free many, many friends and their, their companies and things like that. I, I'm still an, I, I want to make sure that this whole industry uh, develops in, in a good direction. Mm, but, but yeah, I mean, my, my actual work, most of it is, is definitely just, just advising those companies in product design, which is kind of my first love. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, uh, I have been just reading labels more than most people, I would say. <laughs> and uh, just, yeah, it, it's been quite crazy how, how many labels I've, I've read uh, past more than 15 years. So, so that's kind of my first love, and now, now the, the circle kind of comes, to, comes together. Uh, yeah, I, I love this stuff. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's great. Um, but then also, uh, I'm actually upgrading this book. I'm writing the next, next version of this. I'm expanding the content uh, so that there's more, more information about, uh, about products like this. Also, and uh, yeah, just, just up, updating and expanding the content. So those are the th three, th three things that I mainly do right now. But of course, there's there's so much else that uh, there, there's so many other fun things also. Like for example, today I was advising a French company uh, where, like in Finland, we have these superfood companies. But I mean, for example, if you, if you buy a, a, a ready-made meal from the supermarket, there aren't any really good options there yet. Uh, so uh, my friend has a company, uh, a, a start, startup company uh, taking, taking over that, that side. So today, most of the work day, I was just advising him. And I think actually most of the work I do nowadays is just combining people. Because uh, I remember this word, this word, uh, grand old man. Uh, there was, I, I don't remember where I heard it first, but, but of course what the word means is somebody who has kind of created an, an industry or, or, a, or a sport or a hobby or, or something, and then he's the grand old man of that, that whole scene. So I, I kind of have that status in, in these circles in, in some way in, in Finland. Even though I haven't been the most successful, but I have been doing this longer than pretty much anybody else. So, so I have this social capital and I'm, I think most of the value that I create is through just uh, finding the right people for, for the right uh, opportunities. And also sometimes just, uh, just uh, arranging something fun somewhere and just going through my list of people and in inviting the right people to, to meet each other. And sometimes it, it leads to people doing some, some nice things together. So, so I, I, I always wanted to be the guy who doesn't have to worry about his income so, so much that I could just look at this whole industry and, and make sure that everybody's in the right place and things like that. So nowadays I feel like I'm more than ever before I'm in that kind of position. I have to do a little bit product design, which I also love. But then most of my time, I can actually just like, okay, uh, who, sh who should meet who? Or, or like, what, what does my friend's company need right now? And, and things like this. And, oh, this, this girl, Maya, like she's making just amazing recipes and taking amazing photos. And, and who could use that kind of skill right now? And so, yeah. Oli Posty, the grand old man of superfood and his book supermarket survival hold it up for everybody um here he's got some of our products it's great thank you um 
Where can they find your blog though? You have a blog? Because I, you know, I, I love, or are you still writing? Are you, can, is there any way to find you other than just to go hang out at, at a health food have, event in, in, in Finland? <laughs> I have zero technical skills. So I have a few websites, but they look so horrible that I don't even want to. <laughs> Got it. Click the, but, but yeah, I mean, super Maybe social survival. media? Super survival. Yeah, yeah I mean, so you can find. Uh, yeah, you can find my name, Olli Posti, in any social media, pretty much, and also in Google. And also, uh, if you Google or put in any social media the supermarket survival name, uh, in case you know Finnish language. I also have That's this. That's great. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have also olliposti.com uh, website, which is in English. There's like one article there, but yeah, maybe, maybe at some point. But yeah, I guess I'm well, just with having Google, too much with, fun with right Google now. now yeah. Google now translates everything, so it's much easier to communicate with people. And uh, I think uh, <laughs> you're one of the you have an incredible story. Um, I think it's awesome. I think it's fascinating for people who have, you know, it's one thing to advocate health. It's a whole other thing to advocate health after you've overcome a serious debilitating condition, and then you know, kind of transcend that into another world. And that's truly truly remarkable and uh you're a living example of all of what's possible and i'm hoping that someone might get inspired who might be suffering i mean the awesome health podcast we designed it to interview the best the brightest the most interesting the most transcendent the people who are out there who are making a difference in the world and you're making a difference in the world and i think you're a very humble guy uh, and are, are probably, uh, I would say, as they would say in America, underselling yourself. Uh, I think it's a great thing. I think you got a great message and I'm just delighted to have you here on the show. And I would encourage anyone to, uh, if you're going out to one of the biohacking summits this fall that should be on, or there's another one, I think in Amsterdam, I don't know if you're going to go to that one. Are you going to be at the Amsterdam one if it's open? Oh, uh, uh, I, I heard that uh, due to the Corona situation, they, they might not have that. They've moved, they've moved some and, uh, but I think they're still yeah. having it, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. I, I definitely want to attend all those biohacking summits that I can. They are really awesome. And also one, great I want to, to say one thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is not a, a paid plug or anything like that, but your products are <laughs> amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm actually out of most of my enzymes right now, so I probably even today I will actually put in an order to the biohacker store in Finland. They they carry your enzymes, the the capex and the mass enzymes, and also the others. But most of all, the capex and the mass enzymes, like they they have changed my life. But now I have been out of them for maybe maybe a month, so I'm really missing missing them. So I will have to put in an order today because yeah, I mean. They are like miles above the above the, the rest. So, thank you for those products. Like, oh, thank, thank you for you. for doing that work. <laughs> and very, it's very, very important, inspiring for me because my my main job is is to des design products. So I'm always looking for the best ones. I'm always trying them out, and then like trying to learn something. Yeah, we we share that. So thank you so much, and uh, I'll uh, I'll make sure Vita organizes that uh, for you after the show. Hey, everybody. Uh, I want to thank you for joining for another day on the Awesome Health Podcast. Uh, fascinating story today. Check out the Supermarket Survival Guide, and I'm sure we'll be hearing from the grand old man himself again. Thank you very much for joining us today, Oli. Really appreciate it, and I love that, the grand old man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to own that because I think it's fantastic. Take care and have a great day. Thanks. And now for a Bioptimizer's Fixed Digestion Tip. Turn cultured foods into superfoods. Raw fermented foods like sauerkraut and low sugar live yogurt can be good for you, but rarely have enough of the right probiotic strains for therapeutic benefit. So here's a way that you can turn them into superfoods. What I do is I get some raw sauerkraut or a healthy yogurt. Ideally, you know, it's grass fed or coconut based, and you can empty three caps of P3OM into a container and mix it up thoroughly. Leave it at room temperature for a couple of hours before putting it back into the fridge. And what's going to happen is these probiotic levels will be multiplied. In fact, it doubles every 20 minutes. And then what you're going to get is you're going to have a food with strong proteolytic activity. To learn more about P3OM and why its patented strains make it the strongest probiotic available, go to www 
by optimizers.com. Thank you for listening to the by optimizers. Awesome health podcast. You can find more information at by optimizers.com. <laughs>